Hello, my name is Chrissy Champagne, and you are listening to Residue, a true crime podcast dedicated to keeping you paranoid. This week's nightmare is going to be about John Jamelski. And just to add a little more horror into this story, this man lived less than a few miles from me in my own hometown. So how do you think you'd feel if you were 15 years old and you were locked at your house in that room for a year? I would not mind living down there in that room. It was absolutely beautiful. There was a bed. There was water. And you say everything a girl could want in that dungeon? Anything that they wanted, except leaving at certain times, was there. John Jamelski was born May 9th, 1935. He was born and raised in DeWitt, New York, and attended Fayetteville High School. During this time, he was bullied by his classmates and given the name Germs Jamelski. In 1959, John married his wife, Dorothy Richmond. She was a school teacher, and the couple went on to have three sons. From all accounts, the family led a pretty normal life. John worked as a Little League coach. He held numerous jobs throughout his life. He worked at a grocery store, as a real estate investor, and as a carpenter. There is no significant events around this time that are recorded. Stories do start to surface once the boys grew up and moved out. It was around 1980 that John had become the target of his neighborhood due to the poor upkeep of his home and his yard. His home looked like a hoarder's house and neighbors called the cops numerous times to complain about this. Jamelski's solution was to build a tall wooden fence around the property. Those who knew him, even slightly, described Mr. Jamelski as an odd and opinionated man with strong views on politics, religion, and the environment. Jamelski lived very frugally. He was a penny pincher. He did collect cans and bottles and had over 13,000 cans and bottles at the time of his arrest. He used to harass the local library to give him the coupons out of the newspapers. So instead of even paying to buy a newspaper, he would wait for the librarians to get rid of the old papers and he would take those coupons out of there. Even being the cheap ass that Jamelski was, it was noted that he was a very, very wealthy man. And for the man who walked around in ripped jeans, hooded sweatshirts, and old baseball caps, it was estimated that he was worth anywhere from one to $28 million. It's now 1984 and Jamelski's world is about to fall apart. His wife Dorothy is diagnosed with cancer and John is extremely upset. Not upset that his wife is dying of cancer, but upset that now he can't have sex whenever he wants to. This will lead to John's midlife crisis, and this will lead to the nightmare of five young women. Before John begins his reign of terror across Syracuse, New York, he takes a teenage girlfriend into his home and he lets her live there. He has now started having an affair on Dorothy and it it is with a 15-year-old girl. He moves the 15-year-old girl into his home and it causes a lot of friction amongst the family members, (laughs) as you would expect. He did get into a fist fight with one of his sons at a family function, and soon this teenage girl decides that this is way too much for her, and she's going to leave. This is when John says, this is never going to happen again. No girl is ever going to leave me again. It's 1988, and John's wife, Dorothy, has now become bedridden. He decides this is the time he's going to take his first victim. Victim number one, Kirsten. She's 14 years old. She was just walking home. Jamelski pulls up to her in his 1975 Mercury Comet. He speaks like he's a younger teenager, not a 50-year-old man, so it makes her feel comfortable. 
He drove Kirsten to his mom's house. He knocked her out with chloroform. She wakes up chained to a wall in a shed or an underground storage unit. It was so small that she couldn't stand up. No one could hear her scream. He had sex with her every single day for six months straight in that tiny little bunker. This is when he decides he needs a bigger, more permanent space. He tells his son Brian that he's building a bomb shelter and Brian helps him build what would become the sex dungeon. Unknowingly, Brian is helping his father build this dungeon to keep Kirsten in. It's a steel door that leads to an eight foot long tunnel, which had to be traversed on hands and knees. That led to yet another steel door, which finally led to a room that was eight feet high, 24 feet long, and 12 feet wide. The entry was a small box located just under the top of the room, so the person entering had to turn around on their hands and knees and step down onto a small three-rung ladder. Jamelski would tie his victims up with a chain that connected to an ankle bracelet. In the center of the room was a stained bathtub on top of a raised wooden deck. It was here that the victims were forced to bathe using a garden hose. There was a drain plug, but no plumbing. When the tub was drained, the water had nowhere to go but on the cement floor of the dungeon, where it remained until evaporated, making the room damp and moldy. An aluminum frame chair with no seat was positioned over a pail, a crude toilet that was used to further degrade the victims. A clock radio sat on top of a filthy portable refrigerator. Next to a yellow extension cord which ran out from a hole in the top of the walls was an 8-inch aluminum hose that pumped warm air from the house furnace. Those who have crawled through this seven-foot-long passageway into the windowless spaces describe them as dank, claustrophobic, and utterly terrifying. Inside of the dungeon, a crucifix hung to the door next to the words, Peace to all who enter here. Jamelski made Kirsten write everything down that she did throughout the day. Brush her teeth, have sex, He would watch her bathe, photograph her. With all of his victims, he convinces them that he is a part of a sex cult full of members of the police department, politicians, lawyers, powerful men. He tells Kirsten that there are other victims in the house and that she needed to do what he said or else he was going to harm her family. And John made Kirsten believe this because what he did when he would go back to Kirsten's house, knock on her mother's door and pretend like he worked for their landlord and she would allow him in not knowing who this man was and he would take pictures of the inside of the house and he would go back to Kirsten and show her, look, I met your mother, I've been inside of your home, they will all die if you do not do what I tell you to do. John would have Kirsten write letters home to her mom, telling her that she's fine, that she just wanted to be with some friends in New York City. John called Kirsten his girlfriend, and he did believe that they were in love. He decides to take Kirsten to California for a vacation, and he actually asks his son Brian to drive them to the airport. Kirsten is in the back seat, blindfolded, and Brian drives his father, and this young teenage girl who has a blindfold on to the airport. After the California trip is over, John and Kirsten are back in Syracuse, New York at the airport. John tells her that she can go home now. She can just leave, but she better not tell anyone anything or he will come back and kill her and her whole family. Kirsten never tells anyone. John goes four years without any victims that we know of. And then in 1991, his mother dies. He inherits her money, and he waits until 1995 until he gets his next victim. Victim number two, Michelle. She is also 14 years old. It's March 31st, 1995. Michelle is walking home. She also has a runaway record. He tells her that he needs help with a package back at his house and he will give her money if she comes with him to his house to help with this package. She gets in his car, goes to his house, 
The moment he has Michelle in his house, John looks down at her ankles and he says to her, oh, what's that? As Michelle looks down, he shackles her. He does the same exact things to her that he did to victim number one. He switches it up a little bit, and with Michelle, he decides to videotape her. So there are numerous videos on the internet that you can see John and Michelle dancing together. He used the video camera a lot with her. He keeps victim number two for 13 months. One day, he blindfolds her, and he just drives her back to her mother's house threatens her with all of the same things that he threatened Kirsten with. Killing your family, he's in a powerful group, do not tell anyone. After being released, the one difference with Michelle was that she did tell her mother. She went straight to her mother, told her everything, and her mother was too afraid to go to the police because John would now stalk their home, sit outside in his car, and watch them. And they believed his stories. They did believe if they went to the police, nothing would happen because he's such a powerful man. August 30th, 1997. Victim number three, Tina. Victim number three is 53 years old. She was Vietnamese and didn't speak English very well. He just went from kidnapping two 14-year-olds to a 53-year-old woman. All five of these women are of different races, different ages. I don't believe that's a coincidence. I believe that in his distorted mind, this was just another form of collection for him. This time with Tina, the psychological torture begins. He does things with Tina like throw a bunch of screws and nails in front of her and he tells her that for the entire day she has to separate all of the screws and nails. He also gets physical with Tina, hitting her in the head so hard that he burst one of her eardrums permanently. She is still deaf in one ear. He lets Tina go after nine months. This time, Tina goes straight to the police. She tells them everything she just experienced and they do not believe her. It's now 1998 and Dorothy, John's wife, has passed away. By May 2001, he is looking for another victim. Victim number four, Jennifer. 26 years old, she has two kids. He invited her into his car. She thought that he was friendly. She wakes up in the dungeon. All of the same stuff begins again now for Jennifer. One difference is that John adds in that if Jennifer doesn't behave, he's going to sell her over the internet for $30,000. She fought back so much in the time that John had her in the dungeon, which was two months. Jennifer fought so hard that he let her go quicker than he let the other girls go. She goes right to the police, and they also don't believe her. This is the part about this story that infuriates me the most, having had this happen in my hometown. I remember watching Jennifer on an episode of Oprah Winfrey in 2004, and she spoke about how she had gone to the police and told them about the dungeon. She described everything that was written on the walls, which Tina had previously done, so that should have been in some kind of police report already. But she also told them the make and model of his vehicle, which was a Mercury Comet. I can't tell you the make and model of any vehicle. I know color. And she gave them the wrong year. So they had make model, they had information on a dungeon, which another woman had just come to the police department and talked about. And they said that No one in that area had a registered 1974 Mercury Comet because John had a 1975 Mercury Comet. So the police just told Jennifer, go home. There's nothing we can do for you. Sorry. At this point, John is unaware that his victims are beginning to fight back. It's now October 2002, and John abducts his fifth victim, Mika. She's 16 years old. He offered her a way to make money, the same stuff he did to every other victim, verbatim, except that this time, Mika 
wasn't going to let him get away with this. He would take her out places all of the time. He even planned on taking her to his 50th high school reunion. He would take her to McDonald's, bowling alleys. And the part that gets me the most is that he used to take her to a karaoke bar in our town called Freddy's. And my friends and I, at this point in time, would be at this karaoke bar every single week, sometimes more than once. So it has always kind of messed with my brain a little bit. Like, did I see John Jamelski and his victim in a karaoke bar? So we've now come to the part of the story that gives me chills, is going to give you chills, and is going to make you stand up and cheer for Mika. So as we know, John is a collector. John is obsessed with collecting cans and bottles. Where does he go every week? He goes to a recycling center. It is called FM Returnables. At FM Returnables, we are going to meet two new heroes to this story named Terry Carncross and Keith Alexander. Both work at FM Returnables and both knew John Jamelski because he would come in quite often. They said that he was an odd guy, but he was always pleasant and always polite. It's April 2003. John and Mika enter FM Returnables and Terry Karn Cross is working. Keith Alexander is actually at a pet boutique a few a few doors down because he's helping someone set up their shop. Terry and John are striking up a conversation and John asks if Mika would be allowed to use the telephone at the store and she needed to call her church. Apparently which I don't understand, (laughs) but we'll get to that. So um, Terry's explaining to John that Keith is just a few doors down and um, they're finishing up their conversation. John decides that he wants to go visit Keith for a little bit. So he says goodbye to Terry and John and Mika start to walk towards the pet boutique. After John and Mika walk out the door of FM Returnables, the phone rings. Terry Carr and Cross picks up the phone and hears a frightened young woman on the other line asking where her sister is. This woman tells a frightening tale about how her young sister has been missing and she had just called her from FM Returnables and all she said was rapist. Terry quickly calls Keith Alexander and tells him the entire story. She's so frightened She tells him, John said he was coming to see you. You have to get his license plate number. You have to help this girl. Keith Alexander has stated in interviews that when he first heard this story, he didn't believe it. It seemed incomprehensible because um, Jamelski was a quirky guy, yeah, but he didn't seem threatening. But the moment he spotted Jamelski and Mika walking towards him, he knew. He got Jamelski's license plate number and he called 911. And it was very quickly after that that the police, Terry, Keith, and now Mika's sister have all gathered at FM Returnables. It is at this point that Mika calls her sister again and Manlius police officer Elizabeth Butler took the phone. She said that Mika said she was at a business. She could see a sign for Target through the window. And very quickly, the police knew that they were at Fayetteville Dodge, a car dealership in Fayetteville, New York. Police rush to Fayetteville Dodge, and that is where they find Jamelski's 1975 Mercury Comet with Mika inside of the car. Mika jumps out of the car and runs to a police officer, now retired Officer Nadine Zeski. She runs to Officer Zeski, jumps in her arms, and says, Thank God you're a girl. Statements from the women Jamelski imprisoned and assaulted were read at his sentencing in 2003. One woman told the court a part of her died in the bunker. One wrote about crying every night for her baby, fearing she'd never see her child again. And another woman said she was plagued by nightmares and by the pain of knowing her children thought she was dead. A 
According to the 2004 Oprah episode, two of the victims that were interviewed said they had never received therapy for any of this trauma that they had gone through. John Jamelski believed that he would get a slap on the wrist in community service, but ultimately he pleaded guilty to five counts of first-degree kidnapping, and in July 2003, he was sentenced to 18 years to 99 years. During his first parole hearing, Jamelski said it was a very comfortable mattress. I slept on it. He also told them that in the bunker, there were bubble baths with scented candles and a shower for privacy. Jamelski failed to ever take responsibility for his actions and the harm that he caused his victims. He is currently housed in the Mohawk Correctional Facility. On December 22nd, 2020, Jamelski was denied parole in his first appearance before the parole board. He was denied parole again on December 22nd, 2022. In prison, Jamelski has everything that he needs. The only thing he doesn't have is he's not allowed to leave. Thank you for listening to this week's episode of Residue. My name is Chrissy Champagne, and as always... Stay paranoid.